Walker. So I started this Bible study for several reasons. I've taught the Bible for about a dozen years in a variety of capacities, and my wife and I uh, left the church that we were members at uh, a couple years ago, and we've been looking for a church. And since that time, I really haven't had a chance to teach Sunday school or do anything, and it's been killing me. Uh, about 18 years ago, I promised God that I would follow him the rest of my life, uh, so long as he would show me who he was and what he wanted me to do. And shortly after that, he showed me he wanted me teaching the Bible, which I've done, uh, as I said, uh, uh, for about a dozen years. So and other than, or instead of waiting to find a church and then get involved and hopefully get a Sunday school class, uh, I wanted to get going and my wife thought it was a great idea and I've had some friends who have been in Sunday school classes of mine over the years keep in touch with me and ask if I was doing this. So here we are. Uh, number two, we found it's desperately needed. As my wife and I have been visiting churches around the valley trying to find a home, we found out that uh, there's an alarming number of Christians that uh, know little uh, about the Bible. Uh, on top of that, we even found that there is a lot of really weird or at least confusing at best uh, things that were being taught in uh, churches. And um, <clears throat> anyway, we wanted to, uh, you know, hopefully teach what the Bible says without being uh, confusing or have any weird doctrines. Uh, number three, we wanted to have a place where people might feel comfortable to come. I have a lot of friends who <clears throat> think the church ceiling will fall in if they walk in the door, and hopefully a home might be a little more inviting or comfortable, so we wanted to have a little Bible study at our home and see if we could draw some folks in. So <clears throat> Randy already gets one gold star for inviting a friend, and this is obviously open. Invite whoever you think might want to come, so long as they have a good Good attitude and a reasonably open mind, they're going to be happy here. Uh, let's see. Okay, so at this Bible study, questions are not only allowed, they're encouraged. At any time whatsoever, while I'm going over anything in the Bible, just raise your hand. We'll stop what we're talking about. We will answer your question. Uh, the goal of this Bible study is not to get through a chapter in the book or a certain amount of the curriculum or what have you. The goal is to learn what the Bible says and hopefully get to know God in the process. So if, I'm, if I breeze past an idea or I'm not very clear, just raise your hand. Other people are probably confused or lost as well, and I'll you know, backtrack or I'll answer any questions that you have. Along with that, uh, depending on the question, we might just say, you know what, that's a great question, but it's gonna be a long answer. We'll teach that in two weeks and we'll just cover whatever you wanna learn. Because really, that's usually the way I've done Sunday school for, for 10 years, is I only had to write a few lessons and then people had questions and that's what we taught, you know, kinda uh, the rest of my life. Uh, okay, here's one that uh, might sound strange. This Bible study is not meant to be encouraging. <laughs> Now, you might be encouraged at this Bible study, but a lot of Sunday morning church services, their message is maybe a little bit of a shot in the arm, kind of an encouragement. Here we go, going to be a better Christian this week. Um, that's great if we do that, but the purpose is to be educational and instructional as opposed to more of a, you know, kind of cheerleader uh, mentality. And uh, finally, <clears throat> I am not going to ask you to believe anything that I tell you just because I say it. You're going to hear me say this phrase a whole lot, read the Bible, do your own homework. Okay, I have no uh, reason to try to twist anyone's arm to believe what I'm telling you. Uh, you're in a bad place if you're ever encouraged not to read the Bible, and uh, you're in just as bad of a place if you read the Bible, but then they discourage you from asking any questions. Okay, those are not good places and we don't want to be that. So, any questions so far? Bathrooms right down the hall over here on the right. And obviously, you know, um, get a beverage as you need. Please silence your cell phones if you would. And open up to the book of Genesis chapter 1. And I'm going to bow my head for a brief word of prayer and we're going to jump right in. Uh, Lord, we want to ask that you would please have your hand a blessing upon everything we do and say this evening. Uh, I certainly would love it if you would speak through me. Just guide and direct make this a nice, fun time where we can learn about you, learn about the Bible, and hopefully grow as a Christian and be a, a better person than when we, you know, showed up uh, uh, at the beginning of the Bible study. Uh, we love you greatly, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so this is my makeshift uh, pulpit. <laughs> 
Uh, believe it or not, I have a little laptop stand on order, so when that gets here, I won't have a 55-gallon drum uh, for, a, uh, for a pulpit. All right, so Genesis chapter 1, <clears throat> and I'm going to open up here, and I'm going to read a couple of verses, then we're going to talk about it, and we'll do this a few times. So uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. All right, so starting right there. In verse 1, God names two things. What are they? Anything? First verse. Just the first verse. Verse number 1. Yes, he named heaven and earth. Now, technically, he names the planet earth in verse number 10. Okay, but here he names two things, heaven and earth. Okay, so right here, let's talk about earth. What are the names of the nine planets? <laughs> like, yeah, I knew that back in seventh grade. Yeah, earth, thank you. <laughs> That's good. Okay, one down. Mercury, Venus, earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto. Okay, my very extravagant mother just served us nine pancakes. What is it about those nine planets <clears throat> that should pop out to us? Okay, Mercury, Roman god of money and commerce. Venus, Roman goddess of sex, love, and fertility. Mars, Roman god of war. Jupiter, Roman god of the sky and thunder. Saturn, wealth, agriculture, and plenty. Uranus, Greek god of the sky. Neptune, Roman god of the sea, also known as Poseidon. And Pluto, the Greek god of the underworld, also known as Hades. What are eight of the nine planets named after? Pagan gods. Why? Because people name them. Out of the nine planets, there's one planet that's not named after a pagan god. Which one is that? And why? Because God named it. Okay, <clears throat> Earth is the only planet that is not named after a pagan deity, because God named it. Now, what three things, this is a tougher one, what three things did God create in the first verse of the Bible? He named two of them, but he actually created three things. Okay, the beginning, which was he created what? Think broader. Time. Very good. In the beginning, that was time. God created it. Okay, so that's one. What else other than time? Okay, what are we going to call heaven? Broader term. <clears throat> he created space. And third, earth. Okay, which we could argue was simply dirt and it was named, the planet was named earth in verse 10, matter. Okay, in verse number, <clears throat> um, uh, now I already forgot, uh, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. In verse number one, God created three things, time, space, and matter. In the beginning tells us that there was no time prior to this statement. Our universe did not exist outside of it being created by God in this verse. So we have time, we have space, and we have matter. So we created three things. Now, those three things come in three forms. What are they? What, the th what are the three forms of time? Past, present, and future. What are the three forms of space? Get to use my chalkboard. Space is made up of? Yes. Okay. The X, the Y, right? and the Z axes, okay, length, width, and height. Space is made up of three planes. And then matter comes in three forms. Solid, liquid, gas. Okay, so in the very first verse, God made three things, and each of those three things come in three forms. God made and created a trinity of trinities in, in just one verse. Okay, how did God make it? Randy? Okay, with his will. Very good. He just spoke it into existence. He wanted it, and it happened. And then, <clears throat> look at verse 4. What does God use as an adjective to describe what he created? It was good. 
Okay, God made it and he called it good. So is it fair to say that everything God does or God created is good? Or you could argue this if you want. Okay, but what we find is that <clears throat> here in the beginning, and we're going to see that God uses the word good to describe his creation, I want to say uh, not quite a dozen times as you go through chapter one. <clears throat> but we start to see a pattern here in the book of Genesis. He says it, it comes to pass, and it's good. And we see that over and over and over and over again in chapter one. God says it, it happens, and it's good. And this pattern, God set down in the very first book to show us for the rest of your life, everything you're going to learn about me, everything I'm going to tell you, okay, if I say it, it is going to happen, and it is good. Might not always seem good, might not be able to understand how it's good immediately, but believe me, if I made it, if I did it, it is for good. All right? Any questions there? Anyone want to throw out the outlier? Correct. Now, do some of God's things end up being used for evil? Sure. But God created Satan, and what was Satan's proper name when God created him? Lucifer. Lucifer was one of three, okay, yes, archangels, in charge of one-third of heaven. Okay, Michael and Gabriel are the other two. That we can talk about celestial bodies and how they break down. Okay, but there was Lucifer. So Lucifer was meant to worship God, and rule over one third of the angels and direct them. And later on, and this is a stretch, but we, I can show you how Lucifer, part of his job had to do with, um, we'll call it music and entertainment. Okay, he was the, anyway, I'm not gonna get off into a, 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 a Bible study on Lucifer, okay, but, but we'll get there. Yeah, go ahead, yeah, go ahead and get him. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so, uh, yes, even when God created Lucifer, it was for a good purpose, but we can't blame God for Lucifer exercising his free will and deciding to throw a wrench in the plant, right? So, um, okay, so let's see where we are. Uh, good, and he creates a pattern. All right, now I'm going to give you a term here, and this term is going to be important for uh, E, X, E, G, E, S, I, S. Please no making fun of my spelling or grammar. They are both horrific. Okay, exegesis. This is an important word, and it's import an important word in your life. You just might not know it yet. So what is exegesis? It's the explanation or critical interpretation of a text. Now, how do we specifically define exegesis? In this group, we're going to apply several specific principles when interpreting scripture. These are going to help you to understand the Bible whenever you read it, by yourself, wherever you are. So one of the specific principles, this is, all, this is Patrick Hayes' exegesis. Okay? This is how I teach people how to, how to read and understand the Bible. <clears throat> okay? One of the principles is patterns. Another one of the principles is trends. Now this is important when reading the Bible. Patterns, that's something that repeats in a recognizable way. Just like in Genesis chapter one, God made it or God spoke it, it happened, it was good. He spoke it, it happened, it was good. He spoke it, it happened, it was good. We find out that that's a pattern throughout the Bible. When God says, do this and this will happen, it's gonna happen. I mean, there's no way around it. When God says it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. And God's purpose for doing it is good, although, you know, sometimes there's a sharp end of the stick. Then we have trends, and that's the general direction something takes over time. Now, when we're reading the Bible, no matter what we're reading, if we see a pattern where the Bible teaches this one thing over and over and over again, and then we come to this one verse, and it's like, that seems to say the opposite. Can we put all of our stock into that one verse? No, because there's a pattern over here, over <clears throat> dozens and dozens of books of the Bible, over dozens of authors, over thousands of years that all say the same thing. We can't hang our hat on this one verse and say, oh, this is definitely what God wants. That is how weird, crazy, occult churches come up. 
they, they hang their hat on one verse that flies in the face of a pattern throughout the whole Bible, which is why it's very important you read the whole Bible. <clears throat> Anyone can open up the Bible and bring one verse and take it out of context. It's like, well, that's weird. Well, it is if you take it out of context by itself. That's why when we read the Bible, we want to understand <clears throat> what the pattern is and what the trend is. And then we can understand God's intention when he's explaining things to us. Any questions on that? Okay. So, <clears throat> let's see. Okay, here's one more principle we adhere to when interpreting Scripture. Don't do it. Don't interpret it. Just believe what it says. The very best thing we could ever do when reading the Bible <clears throat> is just believe exactly what it says all the time. The only time we don't believe exactly what it says is when the Bible itself tells us that it is an analogy, that it is a parable. Jesus started off all of his parables by saying, this is the parable of. So we know it's not real people doing real things. This is a story <clears throat> that didn't happen to help us understand a point. But outside of when the Bible tells us not to believe it literally, believe it literally. That's what we're supposed to do. Okay, any questions on that? We're going to talk about the topic of exegesis all the time as we go on, but I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. No questions yet? All right, don't be scared. All right, in Genesis chapter 1, God says things are good in verses 4, 10, 12, 18, 21, and 25. Literally after everything that he does. In verse 5, moving on. <clears throat> in verse number 5, the evening and the morning were the first day. All right, when does our day start? <laughs> when the alarm clock goes off. Okay, but what time does our day start? If I were to, currently it's Tuesday. When is it going to be Wednesday? Right? Midnight. Now, in the Bible, what does the Bible say as far as the start of the day? When is that? Randy, who heard the lesson earlier. When the sun sets. Okay, so the biblical day, and look at this, the evening and the morning were the first day. So when does the biblical day start? In the evening, okay, at sunset. Sunset is the beginning of the day, and then the next sunset is the end of the day. Okay, which is why, and, and keep in mind, now this is another thing that's going to help us with our interpretation and understanding of the Bible. In Judaism, the day starts at sundown and ends the following sundown. When Jesus was on the cross, the Romans <clears throat> said, you have to hurry up and make sure he dies so that we can take him down and they can bury him before what? Before sundown. Why? Because the Jews were the ones that were going to take him down and bury them, and they're not allowed to work on the Sabbath. Okay, and the next, okay, so, and that was the day leading up to the Passover feast, which is the Sabbath. We understand that the Jewish calendar, as far as the week goes, Saturday, every week is a special day for them, but also every Jewish holy day. Passover was one of them. So the idea was they had to have Jesus dead prior to sundown before the Sabbath started. Okay, well, that is because there were Jews that were going to deal with him and they needed to get their work done because they're not allowed to work on a holy day. So the day starts at sundown. <clears throat> okay. Now, another thing to remember when reading the Bible is that the Bible is a Jewish book. This is a Jewish book written by Jewish people who worship their Jewish God. And one of the great reasons that people have trouble understanding it is because we look at it through modern day American glasses. It's not gonna make sense if you look at it through modern day American glasses. It was written <clears throat> by Jewish authors who worshiped a Jewish God and their Jewish religion. Make sense? Okay, all the way up through the New Testament you find that to be the case. <clears throat> A lot of people stumble when trying to understand the Bible because they want to follow the modern American line of thought. <clears throat> I'll give you another one. How many days in a year? 360. 
It's a Jewish calendar. 12 months to 30 days. So when you start counting up days and months to figure out prophecy and when this happened and when that happened, your numbers will always be off unless you count with 360 days. Remember, the guy's writing it. They weren't modern-day Americans. Okay, they were, it was an ancient Hebrew culture, and that's what you have to remember when reading the book. Far too many people know nothing about Judaism, and that's why they stumble and, and have trouble understanding a lot of the parables and a lot of the ways they did things. <clears throat> anyway, I'm going to kick that one and keep on moving. More on that to follow. All right, verses 6 and 7, let's read that. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. All right. What on earth is a firmament? Okay. Land. Let's look at verse 20 and see if the firmament was land because that is the most common answer. In verse number 20, and God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament <clears throat> of heaven. Okay, so where do the birds fly? In the sky, right? Okay, so the firmament, and we're going to get into this more as we go, <clears throat> further definitions. The firmament is our atmosphere. It is the space between the earth and and outer space. Now, <clears throat> God uses, and bear with me here, just bear with me for five minutes and it's going to help you. God uses the word heaven for the second time. The open firmament of heaven and also in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Second time he uses the word, second definition, different meaning. So here's the question. <clears throat> Ready for some strange looks. How many heavens are there? You've been in my class before. <laughs> okay, there are three. There are three heavens, okay? The first heaven described in Genesis chapter 1, verse 20 is our atmosphere, where birds fly. Do we all agree birds fly in the atmosphere? Absolutely. Okay, birds cannot fly outside of the atmosphere. They fly in the air, in the open firmament of heaven. The second heaven described in Gen Genesis chapter 1, verse 14 is outer space from our atmosphere out into affinity. What did God place in the second heaven? Sun, moon, and stars. Okay, and it talks about how God set them in heaven. So heaven number two, <clears throat> where sun, moon, and stars are. Heaven number three is where God lives. Now this one, please understand, is in another uh, dimension. We'll call it a spiritual one. You can call it the fourth dimension. You can call it whatever you want. The point is, we cannot get in a rocket ship and take off and get there. Okay, uh, Captain Kirk and the Enterprise could not travel far enough and long enough and reach where God lives. God lives outside of our three-dimensional universe. We all agree on that? We can't go meet him? Okay, so those are the three heavens. <clears throat> our atmosphere, outer space, and where God lives. Now, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, <clears throat> let's turn there. We read, and I'll start in verse 1, it is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, such an one caught up to the third heaven. <clears throat> now, what Paul is talking about is the time that he died and went and met with the Lord, and the Lord said, nope, not done yet, go on back. And he's talking about a case in Acts chapter 14, verse 19. Here we read, And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Okay, this is the situation that Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians 12, 2, where he was caught up to the third heaven, and that was where God was. Um, he doesn't give any more specifics. I don't, we don't know if it was a long experience or a brief one, but it seems that he died, met God. God said, nope, 
time to go back. And it says there in Acts chapter 14, verse 19, that he arose and walked back into the city and preached, and everyone believed him. Why? Because they had just killed him. Okay, so when the guy did that, <clears throat> everyone was impressed. So it, it worked wonderfully. Anyway, the point is, uh, th this is, and I don't, I'm big on rabbit trails. Uh, Paul also talks about an infirmity in his physical body later on, and we'll, we might touch on that sometime. And it was believed that he had uh, vision troubles, because he talks about when he wrote one of his letters, he did it with very large letters. That's how the people receiving the letter knew it was from him, which was because his eyesight was so bad, and we believe it was because he was bludgeoned to death with big stinking rocks, and that might have caused a problem with his vision or brain damage or something. Again, these are conjectures, but they're fairly popular ones. Okay, heaven number one, two, and three. We're all on the same page? All right. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, verse number nine. Okay, so that makes day number two. Moving on to day number three. <clears throat> And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land Earth. That's where he names the planet specifically with a capital E, Earth. And the gathering together of the waters called he Seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. All right, so in verse number nine, God gives the earth texture, mountains rise, valleys are cut, and the low spots fill with water, giving earth the topography that we enjoy today. What it was like specifically, we don't know, and it doesn't matter because at the time of the flood in Genesis chapter 6, the earth was obviously worked over quite a bit and changed somewhat. How do we know that? Simple. What's at the top of Mount Everest? Limestone. You climb to the top of Mount Everest, chisel through the ice, put your shovel down into the dirt, and you pull up seashells and mollusks. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, it means that Mount Everest was underwater at one point. So we know that the earth has changed a great deal, um, and we attribute uh, that massive change during the uh, flood in Genesis chapter 6, which we will get to. Uh, verse 10, God gives title to our planet. Verse 11, uh, let's see, verse 11 through 13. Okay, so again, this is one I'm just going to touch on and keep running. Seeds are important. They are mentioned in two out of the three plants that God describes, and without going into a deep study on nutrition in the Bible, uh, we've actually found out in, uh, I want to say the last 30 years, that inside of several different types of seeds in plants are rare, more rare vitamins and minerals that are very good for you. Uh, you also find out that out of everything God made, we are pretty much the only creature that doesn't eat the seeds in everything uh, that we eat. Uh, anyway, it was interesting. You know, I found it interesting. God talks about it, you know, says that it's part of our diet later on at the end of chapter two, I believe. And then we find out in, you know, 1990 that seeds are good for us. All right. Uh, let's see. 11, 12, 13. All right. When God describes a classification of plants, he uses the word kind. Now we'll, we will see this again on day number five, but it's important to notice he uses the word kind uh, many times when going through his creation. All right, I'm uh, going to read verses 14 through 19, which makes up day number four. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good and the evening and the morning were the fourth day. All right, there's an awful lot there. This is going to take us a minute. So, verse number 14. 
why did God put the sun, the moon, and the stars up there? What were they for? Okay, they were for light. Sun was for light. Signs and... Okay. Uh Uh-huh. And for days and years. Okay, so God uses them for several things. But... God talks, because we're about to talk about the stars and what the stars are for and what they tell us. And what does that all sound like? Astrology. Okay. Now, there's two different things. There is astrology and astronomy. Now, God is okay with one of these and the other one he is not okay with. And I just want to show you a couple verses here to give you this idea and understand that there is a, uh, there is a big difference and we need to see this. So uh, to give you the verses, if you want to write them down, we're looking at Isaiah 47, verses 13 through 15, Daniel chapter 2, 27 and 28, And then Job chapter 38, verse 31. And I'll go over those again. So starting in Isaiah 47, 13 through 15, God pronounces that astrologers and stargazers are worthless to follow. And God says, don't even bother paying attention to these guys. They don't understand what they're talking about. They're going to steer you in the wrong direction. Don't follow them. You want to follow me, Isaiah talking about, I'm a prophet of the one true God. God told me things. I can tell you what's going to happen in the future. These guys cannot. Okay. In Daniel chapter 2, verses 27 and 28, Daniel points out the difference between the astrologers and the true God of heaven. Let's see, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, 19, and also chapter 17, verse 3, uh, these verses are an outright condemnation against worshiping the sun, the moon, the stars, or any other heavenly body, which would include comets, asteroids, planets, or an eclipse. And in Job 38, verse 31, the Bible specifically... Oh, okay, now we're going to change gears here. So we can clearly see from several verses that God is totally against astrology, okay, and... You know, I'm never going to be able to get you to stop looking up your, uh, what are the, what's it called in the newspaper every day? Yeah, I'm not going to get you to, yeah, I'm not going to get you to stop looking at your horoscope, but I can tell you that God warns against these people because they are going to steal your, steer you in the wrong direction. If you want to know the future, uh, ask God. <clears throat> All right, so in Job 38, verse 31, uh, th- this I find interesting. The Bible specifically mentions Pleiades. Pleiades is a cluster of stars that we see in the constellation of Taurus. Something else you have to understand is that Job is the oldest book in the Bible. Uh, chronologically speaking, you have Genesis, okay, chapters 1 through 6, then you have the book of Job, then you have Genesis uh, chapter 7 through 50. Okay, that is chronologically speaking, Job fits in right after the flood. You say, how do you know that? I can prove that to you very easily. I'm not going to do it now, mostly because I didn't write down any references, and I don't want to stand here guessing for 10 minutes, but I will tell you two weeks from now. See what we did there? It's called a hook. (laughs) So hopefully we get you back. All right, so... Let's see. So this is, this is interesting because God mentions Pleiades, a cluster of stars in the constellation of Taurus, back in the oldest book that was written. So uh, here we also see in the same verse, God mentions the constellation Orion. And then in the following verse, God mentions a star, which is Arcturus. Arcturus is roughly 37 light years from Earth. There are many, many stars that are closer to us. Uh, but this is interesting because <clears throat> Job, the oldest author of a book that we know of, knew about constellations and groups of stars and specific stars by name. Now, why did he care about that? Why did he know about that? Why was that pertinent? Glad you asked. <clears throat> What I know is that the stars were used for navigation as well as a calendar and a clock. It is also theorized that stories could have been told to Adam from God while he was in the Garden of Eden. And those stories, because there was no written word of God at that time, 
God could have explained these stories with the stars. So, now I have a question for you, and if anyone can answer this other than Randy, <clears throat> you'll get two gold stars. How long could Adam and Eve been in the Garden of Eden with God prior to eating the fruit and getting the boot? So, here's what we have. <clears throat> the timeline is, okay, Genesis 1, 1 through, what's the end of the book? 31. <clears throat> now, what this gives us is the creation week, okay, of day 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, this is what we are <clears throat> told. Then, by chapter 3, what we have is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden. We have the serpent come and tempt Eve. Eve takes a bite of the fruit, gives it to Adam, says, don't worry about it, just eat it. Adam eats it. God finds out, kicks them out of the Garden of Eden. You all with me? So Genesis chapter 1 and really chapter 2 is kind of a recap of chapter 1. We're going to get there, probably not by the end of tonight. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 3 tells about Adam and Eve in the garden, eat the forbidden fruit. Because the serpent tempted them, they get kicked out of the garden. Now, here's my question. How much time could Adam have spent in the garden with God from day number, because we know that on day number 7, God rested. That was the first or second day that Adam was around, so we're assuming he rested as well. So then really what we're asking is from day number eight on to the tree, or to, let's just call it the event of sin, how much time could Adam have been in the garden? Sure, how many? <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, so there's a maximum number of years, and I'm going to show you this right now. Okay. So, now we get to do everyone's favorite thing, which is math. All right, so, here's what we got. In order to figure this out, we simply start with a time at which Adam, Adam and Eve had their third son, Seth. Because that's the first date that the Bible gives us prior to the creation week. So if you turn over to, I want to say it's Genesis chapter 5, but I'm not going to, actually, yeah, what, what the, hey, let's, let's look, just so you, you don't call me a liar. Let's go to chapter 4, chapter 5, verse 3. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. So how old was Adam when he had Seth? 130 years old. Okay. Prior to that, he had Cain and Abel, and Cain slew Abel. And prior to that, Adam and Eve, before they had kids, were in the Garden of Eden with God, and they ate the fruit. Everyone with me as far as the timeline goes? All right, so let's do some math and work backwards. So, Adam has Seth, and this is uh, the age of Adam. Age of Adam. And this is the event. So now, Adam and Eve got pregnant with Seth. We're going to use easy numbers, say a gestation period of one year instead of nine months. So Adam was how old when they got pregnant with Seth? 129. Very good. Now, we know that they had Seth after Cain killed Abel. So how old is the minimum number of years that Cain and Abel had to be for one to kill the other? Okay, we're saying 20. Here's the number I'm going to give you, and I don't know. But what I'm going to give you is the minimum age of a Jewish boy turning into a man, which is 12. Okay, that's when they have the bar mitzvah and they become a man. And So we're going to say that Cain and Abel had to be 12 years old. So if one was born, grew up to be 12, the other one was born the next year and grew up to be 12, the older one would be 13, the younger one would be 12 when one killed the other. Fair enough? 
Okay, so if we go backwards, let's see. So we go backwards uh, 12 years um, when they had Cain. How old was Adam? 17. Okay, uh, oops, had Cain. The gestation period for Cain, one year. The gestation period for Seth, one year. So the maximum amount of time Adam could have spent in the garden with God prior to being kicked out would have been 115 years. Does my math sound? Sure. Now, when could he have been kicked out? Day number eight, right? <laughs> we don't know because the Bible only goes up to day number seven. Now, I would say that at a minimum, Adam was going to be in the garden for another week simply because of the tasks that he was assigned. He had to name all of the animals, which were passed in front of him one by one. And he said giraffe and penguin and whatever. Uh, we also find out that he and God had somewhat of a relationship in the garden. We're going to get to that, and we're going to see that there was a trend that God followed. But my point is, God could have lived in the garden with God, learning things, talking with God every single day for over 100 years. Now, there was no written Bible at that time. So, again, how did Adam remember what God told him? Probably had a better memory than we did. Okay, sin wasn't in the world. But I believe that a lot of these stories were written down in the stars and God used them not only for navigation and for a clock and a calendar, but also to be able to tell Adam different stories and knowledge and wisdom and have him remember these things. Now, during that time when he was in the garden, what did Adam do during this time? Go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. Now, this is after Adam and Eve both ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. So, Adam and Eve ate the fruit. And then where did they see God? Walking through the garden in the cool of the day. Now, that suggests, but keep in mind, this is implicit, okay? This is clearly conjecture. It seems that God had a ritual of taking a walk in the garden at a certain time of day, and my assumption would be that he spent that time with Adam and Eve. Why do we believe that? Well, why did God create us? Okay, God created us to spend time with us. That's why he commands us to pray to him and talk to him. That's why he created heaven, a place where we get to hang out with him for eternity, so God wanted to spend time with his creation, his child, Adam. And I believe he had a daily ritual. Maybe he took off Saturdays. I have no idea. But it seems that Adam and God had a relationship. After all, there was only Adam and Eve and God. Now, does the Bible spell all that out? Unfortunately, it does not. So as I said, it's conjecture. And please don't form a doctrine or start a church with that as your foundation. Okay, so let's see. At that time, there was no mention of a written word of God. So one of the ideas is that God had the lessons he taught Adam written in the stars. Now, I want to put forth a different theory. Uh, in the very least, this is interesting. I am not convinced that this is true, but I want to throw it out there for you. Uh, there are too many convincing points to ignore this idea. The theory is called the gospel and the stars theory. Now, as we know, on day number six, God created man. At that time, man had no written word of God. There was no copy of the Bible lying around to reference because it hadn't been written yet. What we do know to be true is that God created the stars in, in verse 16 of Genesis chapter 1. More importantly, verse 15 tells us that they were for signs. God used the stars for either a reference purpose or a teaching purpose or both. Now, the gospel and the stars theory states that the 12 constellations of the zodiac tell the gospel message. The zodiac starts with Virgo the Virgin and ends with Leo the Lion. Those two symbols are obviously easy to relate to the life of Christ. He was born of a virgin. He's coming back the second time as a lion. Now, I am personally not convinced that we must stay within the 12 constellations of the zodiac since the beginning of the zodiac dates back to Babylon. 
which is the birthplace of paganism and witchcraft. But some of the signs clearly paint a picture of the life of Christ. Other signs and other constellations are a lot more difficult to try to fit into his life. Along with that, there are constellations that are not included in the 12 constellations in the Zodiac that clearly tell a portion of the life of Christ. The most famous of all of these is the Crux, C-R-U-X, which is called the Southern Cross. Now, you say, Patrick, I've never heard of the Southern Cross. There's a reason. We live in the Northern Hemisphere, so you will never see it. But if you ever travel to the Southern Hemisphere, it is the most obvious constellation in the night sky. Just as Orion and uh, the Little and Big Dipper, which aren't actually constellations, they're in asterism, they're part of a larger constellation, but either way, neither here nor there. Um, just like those things, Orion kind of stands out in the same way so does the Southern Cross, and obviously it's not too hard to figure out where that fits into the life of Christ. Okay. Now, one of the major problems with this theory is that if the Garden of Eden, Eden was in the Northern Hemisphere, and we don't know if it was, Adam would have never seen the Southern Cross or half of the stars in the entire universe. This is why I don't believe in the Gospel of the Stars theory, but if nothing else, it shows how God could have easily used the stars as a teaching tool for all of his followers from Adam to Moses. Because you have to remember, it was Moses that was born and wrote the Pentateuch, Pentateuch being the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And prior to Moses being born, which was 1,487 B.C. or 2,660 years after the creation, uh, when Moses was born, there was no written word, which is an awful lot of time and a whole lot of believers and followers of God that didn't have anything to kind of, you know, relate to each other. If there was a book of any kind that was written, we have no idea what it was, and it, I don't know, could have been lost in the flood. My point is, don't wait for it to show up on the History Channel like they're going to unearth it or something, okay? But the point of the whole thing is, um, I believe that the stars were used as a sign, you know, for God. Okay. Uh, let me hit one more point and then we're going to take a break and we'll be done for the night. All right, who can tell me what the North Star is? What its name is? Very good, Stephanie. Said with enthusiasm and confidence. Okay, Polaris. So Polaris is the North Star. Uh, it is part of the Little Dipper. Now, uh, the North Star, now this is, okay, <clears throat> Earth's axis is off by just a little bit. Currently it's off by 23 and a half degrees. And the north points, the north pole points to a certain star in the sky, which Stephanie just told us is named Polaris. But the earth has what's called a precession. As the earth rotates, the north pole changes. The earth's axis varies between 22.1 and 24 and a half degrees, which means that the north pole and the north uh, Polaris, the, uh, the north star, were different. There was a star named Thuban, which was the North Star roughly 5,000 years ago. This was right around the time that Noah was born. 3000 AD, which will be uh, just under 1,000 years from now, uh, Gamma Cephei uh, will be the next North, North Star, followed by Iota Cephei in the year 5200 AD. So anyway, Polaris will not always be the North Star. There were different North Stars at uh, different times, some of which uh, were Bible times. All right, so right there, we have hit an hour and a minute. We started out with the introduction. Do you guys want me to go another 10 minutes and cover some stuff, or you want to take a break and Randy's up to keep going? Anyone else? Love questions. Love questions. Give it to me, Kim. I know I won't be around that long. <laughs> so you're wondering, is Christ going to come back prior to that? doesn't matter. For today's lesson, I'm just telling you that the North uh, Pole will be pointing at a different star. Do I think we're going to make it until the year 5200 AD? I doubt it. Okay, but 
keep in mind, I tell everyone this, every generation of Christians, starting with the first generation after Christ, thought that the Lord was going to return during their time. To the point where certain followers of Christ, Paul tells us, thought that the second coming had already happened. And he had to correct them when you read through Acts 1st and 2nd Corinthians. So, you know, with that being said, I'm not one that's going to, you know, pick a date. Do I think it'll be another 3,000 years? Sure don't think so. All right, let's go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 16. And we'll only go just a few more minutes, but we'll try to get through. Well, I don't know what we're trying to get through. Okay, and God made two great lights, the greater light. Uh-oh, I'm going to accidentally encourage you. Get ready. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, and he made the stars also. Okay, so the sun took the place of God in that the earth no longer needed the light that God produced. Remember that this here, what we're reading about currently is day number four. When did God create light? Yeah, day number one. Well, where did the light come from? Well, it was God. In, I want to say, 1 John 1, 5, it says, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So remember, when there was light in verse 1, or on, sorry, on day number 1, and the sun was created on day number 4, you got to remember where the light came from, and that was God. So now the sun took the place of God as far as illuminating earth. Earth no longer needed the light that God produced. The sun represents God, and we... Uh, saved people represent the moon. Now, we have God living inside of us in the form of the Holy Spirit. The moon produces zero light. But all the moon is doing is reflecting the light. Just like we are not God, but we can still reflect the light of God that is in our life you know, when we're doing a good job. We as Christians, Christians, although we have God living inside of us, we do not have the power of God in its entirety. We reflect Christ. We are not Christ. We reflect God's power. We do not have God's power. Now, please understand God's power can be demonstrated through us, but it is a very limited version of the actual original source and the greater power, just like the sun and the moon. Now, just as the moon would be dark and ineffectual without the sun, we have nothing to offer outside of God being in our life. Okay, Genesis 1, 17 and 18. To finish up day number four, And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Now, God, let's see, the way God set up the day and the night demonstrates the Christian life. Now, every day there's sun, every day there's darkness. When we are in a bad place and we feel like we are surrounded by darkness, there is always some amount of light there, even if it's very dim. And the thing to remember is that it will only be a matter of time and the sun will rise again. It's something that God told us was going to happen a little over 6,000 years ago. And it's something that's still working out today. And God talks about this in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God says, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. But with the temptation, also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So there is an idea that there is a limit to the darkness. It will never be darker than what you can handle. It doesn't mean it won't be very difficult, and it might not feel like God is pushing the envelope or seeing what you can handle, what your breaking point is. The point is, it will begin to fade and light will appear. And when the light appears, it will be so much light that you can't even remember how dark it was. And I'm sure everyone in one way or another has gone through a very dark or trying time, a time of spiritual darkness where you felt like God was not around and you were alone and it was cold and horrible. And then now you might be through that and you can't even remember how horrible it was because God has brought you through the night and you're back into the daytime. And it's something to remember that no matter how 
difficult of a trial you might be going through, uh, there is light that will come up. Now on the other side of the coin, when the sun is shining, we need to take advantage of the daytime and the light that is offered to us because darkness is going to come again. Okay, it's up and down. It's life. It's how it works. Okay, it's never like this. It's always up and down. Now, for the Christian, we will go through spiritual times of light and darkness. We will go through times where we feel close to God and times where we believe God is nowhere to be found. It is important that during the times of day, when we feel close to God, we do something while we are in the light. The best place to start is always read your Bible and pray a little bit. Get to know God a little bit. It's going to help, and that way we can recognize God's voice when he speaks to us, and we know what to do when he commands us. I personally believe that God will speak to the Christian all day, every day. It's just a matter of how tuned in are we, and how often do we practice hearing his voice. Because God will speak to us. And when we want to know to turn left or right or what to do, we just have to ask. And when God starts telling us, hey, you're heading in a bad direction. This is not a good thing. You need to listen up. So many people just keep on going because they have no idea what God's voice sounds like. Because they've never practiced listening to it. They've never spoken to him. They've never waited to hear uh, from him. And now when it's really dangerous, uh, they miss the sound of his voice. Uh, another thing I tell folks is if you're walking in the daytime and you're doing well and you feel like, you know what, getting closer to God and, and things are going well, uh, attend a church or a Bible study so you can learn more about God. Because at some point, God enlists the help of all of his followers. And the idea here is really grow hay while the sun shines. You ever hear that one? Got to grow hay while the sun shines? Okay, because in the wintertime we can't grow hay. So if, you know, we're doing well, great. You know, listen to the voice of God and be sensitive to his leading. Uh, get close to God and do the next right thing because low points will come in your life where you don't feel like doing it. In the evening and the morning, we're the fourth day. All right, I think that's a good place to close. Okay, so now here's your homework assignment. Just hear it out before you start writing because it's a long one. Someone comes up to you and says, I want to go to heaven when I die. How do I get there? How do you answer? Now, your answer needs to be written out to a person who is largely ignorant of Christianity, and by that I mean that they will ask the question, what does that mean? Okay, so don't just give me one verse and sign your name to it and say, there's my homework assignment, okay? Because the person you're talking to is going to say, well, what does that mean? Okay, so they ask you the question, I want to go to heaven when I die. How do I get there? How do you answer? Write or type out your answer. Have it here for the next meeting. If your answer is, I have no earthly idea, write that down and sign it. Good enough. That there, there is no wrong, well, there is a wrong answer. <laughs> but you're not going to get in trouble for what you answer. I'm just looking for honesty. And I'm going to give you a short homework assignment like that all the time, uh, or I'm going to try to, hopefully, just to keep everyone honest so that, I don't know, at least you crack your Bible once for a minute. Okay, uh, with that, we're done for the night. Anyone have any questions on anything we've taught? or anything that you maybe want to learn about or want answered. So how did Genesis chapter 1, okay, how, did, how was the book of Genesis written when Moses was born in uh, the beginning of Exodus? Okay, so Moses wrote... Genesis. Okay, so a couple quick answers. Number one, we don't know that he wrote Genesis. We don't know who authored Genesis. There is some thought that God or Adam wrote Genesis, and in doing that, it would have had to have been handed down all the way to Noah, survived the flood, and been passed on. And then Moses would have had to have gotten that, and then the belief was that Moses might have edited the book of Genesis. See what I mean? He might have transcribed it or wrote it down. Okay, now, keep in mind, we have no idea. We do know Moses was the author of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Um, if the idea that someone else wrote Genesis and not the idea that God told Moses what to write, because 
Moses did spend a significant amount of time up on Mount Sinai with God when he got the Ten Commandments and big long story to follow. Uh, so could God have given him the information at that point? Absolutely, and Moses could have transcribed. We have no idea. Uh, if it was written at the time of Genesis, it would have had to have fallen into the hands of believers, made it through the flood in Genesis 6, and then by Genesis 12, made it into the hands of Abraham, who we're going to get there, and the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then boom, the rest of the world, you know, starts to move on from there, and then we find out the, uh, the Israelites are enslaved, they end up in Egypt, Moses grows up, and he writes the rest after... Um, Charlton Heston marches in and says, let my people go. So, yeah. Yeah, that's the quick answer. Good question. Any others?